Scoop is back. We are here for the Knights projections. It's going to be a lot of fun. Obviously, a pretty cool team last year. Lots of points were scored. Let's hopefully can watch them again. A very, very fun team to watch. But before we get started, we want to talk about the Brad Arthur interview and the news around their hooking position, which we thought was going to be split between Brennan Hands and Joey Lusick. And it looks like they are now fighting for that spot. Scoop, what are your thoughts on that? Obviously, being an Eels fan, do you prefer them going for the 80 minute hooker strategy with you know, a break glass in case of emergency forward or someone that can jump in, or would you prefer them to job share it? Oh, I don't mind it too much. Honestly, I think that the reason why we might sh have shied away from it is because when we tried Josh Hodgson there, he just, he just wasn't really fit enough at his, mm. with this new style of game to do a lot coming off that injury as well. So I think going for an 80 minute hooker isn't isn't a bad thing. I think it can be a good thing. But for fantasy, well, it's pretty fantastic. Lusick and Hands are both around the sort of the fourth 400k mark or a little bit above and yep. could score you 45 points or even edging up towards 50 if they do play that 80 minutes. So that's humongous value. And to mm. be honest, whoever starts, you should probably just chuck in your team. It has definitely changed my team structure because instead of having sort of two gun hookers, I've gone one gun um, and Lusk currently and use that cash elsewhere. Yeah, perfect. Definitely. Yeah. We'll, we'll change a few things for fantasy and super coach. We'll get, I'll personally get into that a little bit deeper in another episode, but let's stick in with the Knights in this one and we'll kick it off with, we've got David Armstrong in there up top, who is unlikely to feature. We have Bradman Best is second there on the list at 589. So you clearly had, a very, very good year last year and was able to stay on the park was the biggest thing. Do you see any upside in, in, in Bradman there in a pretty tough center position? Um, look, I think if Ponger plays the way he does from close to the get-go, there might be a little bit, but um, it depends. If you think the Knights are going to go absolutely fantastic this year, maybe you go for him, but I don't really expect them to be like a top four, top three team that absolutely sails through all opposition so i think what he did last year is probably put his price at a point where he's not that valuable anymore and we can go for the guys who are true and tested elite options yeah okay who've done it for more than the one season hey uh Jaden braley up next is 575 yeah an interesting player of the past we know that the type of caliber that he can score but coming off a lot of injuries now and, and the emergence of crossland what are your thoughts on Jaden? I think I've had a, a lot of different opinions on it throughout the preseason of swayed from one to the other. Does he play 80? Crossland did too well for him to play 80. Mm. I think they're going to start off at least start off with Braley not playing 80 and then they'll decide whether they want to move him into 80. So okay. I think that there is a chance that Braley drops a few minutes, but if in trials Crossland doesn't really do much at hooker, and he's mostly just in the lock roll. He could be a go because we have seen him in the past hit around that 50 mark or even above sometimes. And he has that value in him if he is playing 80 minutes. Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that he didn't really get any discount because he played sort of too many games last year, right? But I suppose the worry with the trials watch is with Crossland, I think with Braley anyway, it's like unlikely he'll play massive minutes in the trials and, and who else would they blood in that position in the trials. I think like Crossland will have to play sort of some decent minutes there. And I suppose it'd be good for him to in a trial to, to cover some minutes and get, get some sort of, you know, time under his belt in that position, a little bit in lock as well. So I don't even know if it's going to show much. Hey. Yeah. I, I think really the only thing that would sway me is if Crossland didn't touch hooker at all whatsoever in the trials. So, yep. and I don't think that's real likely so uh, I'm personally off Braley, but if the signs are there, he could be one. But I think he's one of these type of players who might fall down by the wayside a little bit now that we have this Eels news, but potentially there is still value there. You would probably just have to hear from coach if he was going to play big minutes, eh? Hey? Yeah. Okay, Jed Cartwright will be our next one because, as you've said, there's a lot of teams that, that well, a lot of people that have him in their team at the moment. Tell, tell us about Jed. Where is he in the pecking order? Look, I think he's pretty well behind a few of the options. You've got Dylan Lucas, who 
had a really made a really good fist of it at the back end of last year, and we'll talk about him a bit later. But they've also signed uh, English international Kai Pierce Paul, and I really can't see Jed Cartwright getting ahead of those two guys. So to start the year, I don't think you should really look at him. He's got that jewel in his basement price, which is probably why people are looking at him. But yeah. I don't think you're going to get him. Yeah, definitely. Jack Cogger's next on the list is 620k. Definitely has priced himself out of contention, I'd say, and he's fighting for a spot. What are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, he there's a good chance he'll make the spot, but yeah, most of that money and most of those points came from the games during Origin where Cleary wasn't playing and Lua wasn't playing or both. And he was doing majority of the kicking, doing all the things you'd want him to do as a moneymaker last year. However, this year, he's priced at 45 and he's playing next to Hastings, who kicks a fair bit, and it's not Penrith. Where how I don't see how he can go up from that price point. Yeah, shout out to those that jumped on him last year. He did a great job, didn't he? Uh, Matt Croker, he has played a couple of years now in that middle rotation. Where do you think he lies in terms of, of minutes for, for one? I think he's probably one that's going to sit in the lower echelon of minutes. I think Leo Thompson's really just stamped his mm. uh, authority in the in this front row rotation of the team. I think having both Saifidi brothers fit and Leo Thompson squishes some of the potential options on the bench. And, I mean, you've got to have a good role and a good PPM to really be considered if you want to be a bench forward, a bit like Sam Hughes. And he's not even basement price. So, look, there could be something there. But for me, I think I have him losing money rather than gaining it. Yep. Sure. Uh, Crossland, you just spoke about, and we'll wait for an injury um, in, in the middle or in, with Braley at, uh, at nine there again. Adam Elliott, he's very, very interesting in my opinion. What do you, what are your, what's your take on him after what happened with all the injuries and, and the like last year? It's a bit of a tough one because we all remember that 2022 streak where he went mental, sort of did what Horsburgh did for maybe a little bit shorter uh, in that Raiders lock spot. And then we thought, oh, he's coming to coming to the Knights. He'll do that again. And he, he kind of didn't, but he was affected and struggled a little bit with some injury. So I think there's more upside uh, than downside to him. But again, I I don't know if he'll get more than about 55, 60 minutes, which he might need in order to become that really good option. Yeah. And did you have a little bit of a, a peek into that, sort of that last six or eight weeks there where he, he did increase those minutes. Did you see anything in that? Um, I haven't specifically, I don't specifically remember that. What, what did you see in that area? Yeah. Just that obviously the minutes came and, and a little bit more of his consistency that he showed in that back end of 2022 was there. Uh, they're obviously humming. Um, but I, I, I can see a lot of that consistency being back just because of yeah you know, him finally shaking a few of those injuries. But I, I've, heard a few people ask me, yeah, seen a few people ask me or, or mention him and and cite that last sort of month or so. You're looking at it now? Yeah. Oh, he did a bit better than I thought, actually. Yeah, he's in that mm. last five games, he's got 65, 56, 31, 60, 42. So that, that would average around about that 50 mark, which honestly, that's not a bad shout. But if we do look at those minutes as well, 57, yeah. 67, yeah. 44, 69, 53, that's going to average out to about that 60 or maybe maybe slightly over. I'll have to do the calculations. Yeah. But There's it, plenty of minutes. It depends and... whether you think he's going to get 60, I'd say. Yeah, I just I think it, it wouldn't be the worst pun for sure. But yeah, I think the big thing with, with that mid position anyways is there's a lot of, a lot of guys in there um, with the Currens and, and the like. But then people are going to want to go to Payne Haas and stuff. So it's going to be hard to find that just under 600k guy like a spot for him but uh if, if, you know i'm not going to push anyone away if they want to go for him tyson tyson frizzell there at 714 he played a, a good a good role last year in, in a bunch of people's squads and and was able to average sort of 55 to 60 at times and be very very consistent there's a little bit of chat about him going to left edge as well what are your thoughts on tyson yeah, he's one of those guys who in the last couple of years has just seemed to be a really good scorer when he's on the park, but will take a knock or a head injury just enough to make it annoying. 
And if you can get around those, which last year we sort of were, if you didn't start with him, he started off uh, real slow, got a, got that HI and that injury. And then he came back at like 100K cheaper and roared, roared into life. Absolute great scores from round four onwards, 69, 54, 74, 58, 52, 48, 52. So if he can do something like that again, that'd be great. But uh, I hadn't heard that potential switch when he's not next to Dan Gagai and Dom Young, maybe maybe it changes a bit. I mean, there's Ponga and there's Marzu and there's Best on the right. But, I mean, at that price, if there is change and a bit of injury, HIA risk, I don't know whether I want to go there at over 700k to start the year. You bring up a good point there, and, and it's that 100k drop. And something to think about when we're looking at all these players and different teams, guys, is, is it potentially for round one, they're not worth the pickup and if they do start slow they do get a concussion or something like that then they they come into your plans for sure because Tyson Brazil at 630k for example we'd be snapping that up every day of the week with a with a decent buy schedule and unlikely to be playing origin so yeah the next guy on our list as well in Dane Gagai could be a very similar thing given he played out of this world last season at 749 now if you're able to get him a little bit cheaper than that in the 600s or you know low 600s for for example then that's where we could see some value from him. You've got him there as an origin slash late season gun. Tell us more about Dane. Yeah, look, the only reason why I haven't listed him in the blue like the rest of the elite guns is that it's just so hard to project a center to average 55 again. Yeah, Like that was, I think, the single best season from a pure center we've seen in like a decade from a fantasy point of view. Yeah. Um, we had our Batemans and our Nikoras a couple of years ago when the, with the center center duel, and that could be fantastic. Mm. But with no Dom Young this year, um, they still might go well, but far out. Paying 749k for a center in round one, that's that's really steep price to pay, and you've got to be really confident that they that Gaga even comes close to matching that in order to want to get him in. Yeah, it's like oh, you'd be you're upset if he gets forty nine in the first game. That's the that's the worry. You're absolutely riding every time he touches the ball, aren't you? Um, Tyson Gamble, the next guy on the list, four sixty eight. You, you said there that from the numbers, surprisingly, might have a couple of points of value. Tell me more about that and, and maybe why you'd still look to avoid anyway. Yeah, Gamble. I had a look. I think it was with Hastings or at five eight or something like that, and he actually did do a little bit better. So if I bring his numbers up and I filter out sort of the low minute games when he played five eighths, um, he did all right. He averaged 38, but I really don't see him doing much more than that. To be mm. honest, I think that's where he tops out at the back end of the year. Hastings stopped kicking again. I think his foot was flaring up again and Gamble took a lot more kick meters last month. He went 273, 271, 355, 436 kick meters. Right. So there's a few things, including that late night's run, that I think just inflated that points a little bit. And, I mean, that's where his ceiling could be. But if sort of around that 38, 40 points is his ceiling and he's priced at 34, that's not quite 7, 8, 9, 10 points of value. No, not that, yeah, the 38 gives you four um, and probably doesn't get those kick meters, does he? All right, so Hastings at the other hand at 557, obviously the organizer of the team. You've still got him as an avoid. Yeah, look, that that foot injury has sort of been hanging around a bit, sort mm. of makes his foot numb, I think he said in interviews. And until he becomes the big dominant kick meter guy who's doing a lot of tackling and not missing much because he's fully fit, I don't really want to touch him. We we had him down last preseason as almost a must have for a couple of months. So we just kind of all faded off him and we were kind of right to do so because he just came out and did a lot from a fantasy perspective. So I don't see a massive reason to change that because he didn't really kick on heaps with that night's run either from memory. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jack Hetherington, there'll probably be a few people that buy him, just don't do it. Thomas Jenkins, I will give you my synopsis and thoughts on Thomas in the wing fullback value video, which is coming out just after this one there. Uh, so, we'll, Scoop, we'll get your thoughts on him. Do you think he's going to get that uh, wing spot on the right? I think that at the moment, I think he's the most likely to get it. I think he's been bought over from Penrith to do a job. 
But there are others who could fill that role, like even a Papa Lungi or something like that. I think that, well, I think he averaged 38 last year at Penrith. But the thing is, that was at Penrith. This is at Knights. And he's still priced at 31. So that's only seven points of value in a worse team. Do you think that he can really push forwards from that? I think and another good thing to bring up for some of these guys, I talked a little bit about it in last video with Sivo, these sort of 400 to 500K yeah. wingers, they can have these big games, yeah, but what if they ruin it with an 18? Where does their money making go? Will they ever make, will Thomas Jenkins ever make it up to four, five, sixty, five, seventy K and make that good money that you want him to? Or will he always have that break every couple of rounds when he has a low one? Yeah, that's right, isn't it? The 18 gives you a break even somewhere in the mid 40s or something like that. And he gets he gets that 45 and he doesn't even make money in those first few weeks. So yeah, it's a it's a fun one that that position. Obviously, we just need to find some more wing fullbacks and centers to cover the likes of you know Campbell and uh, if we actually get any of these cheapy centers, which is unlikely at this point. But we still got a long way to go. Brody Jones and Riley Jones both unlikely to play at this point. Dylan Lucas, I've been very very high on him. You've all heard my takes. Let's hear Scoop's takes. Yeah, I think there is minute if he plays. Uh, over Kai Pierce Paul to start the season, Kai Pierce Paul's not fit or needs some cup to get going or whatever. If Dylan Lucas start the season, I think there's at least five points of value. Is there much more than that? That's where the discussion starts. So we've seen the phenomenon where we've got second year syndrome sometimes from especially <laughs> these kind of edge guys. Um, and we see it in Dylan Lucas's stats. So we see, yeah, 52.8 average when he was starting back row. That's insane. That's that's 12 points of value. Stick him in. But he had 42 tackles a game as an edge. That Good would have boy. been like top five in the NRL on average. He's not going to do that on average. If you, if you go and have a look, I actually went and had a look because of Dylan Lucas, what a good uh, fantasy edge generally averages. And right. it's... About bang on 30. I think anywhere from David Fafita to IPAP and guys like that were about 28 to 32 tackles. That's a 10-point drop. But he's got some pretty good reserve grade stats, hey? Some good attack, good tackle breaks, and pretty decent try scoring. If Tyson Frizzell does move to the left and he moves to the right, next to Gagai, and um, he might do all right. So I do think there is case for him being quite valuable where you see his ceiling is probably a matter for debate and um, do keep an eye on what's happening with Kai Pierce Paul uh, very closely as the preseason moves on. Yeah. To be honest, he's actually not in my side. I, I love him and I, I want him to get the spot, but there's a lot of worries uh, around him there. And what I will say about all those top edges averaging 30 tackles, lazy. They're not Dylan Lucas, are they? <laughs> but you do see that as he said, um, good Queensland Cup stats, but that's obviously with him getting that 90% try scoring rate. And you know, he was averaging 24 tackles a game in New South Wales Cup. It obviously is a little bit slower and he came in the NRL and just wanted to get into his work. And, and it's great to see that he could do that. But yeah, there's definitely a chance for some regression, even if he was to get the spot. And the, the chat around Frizzell going to left was more so because I think they were saying Lucas is more of a right side player and so is Kai Pierce Paul. Okay. So either way, like Frizzell's got the spot um, and yeah, being a veteran, it does seems like he doesn't care where he will be. And he probably doesn't, probably doesn't mind being on that, uh, on that left-hand side with Ponga and, um, and Bradman and all the rest there. So yeah, it's an interesting one for sure. Um, yeah. I'd love for him to get the spot, but we don't know at this point. My Papa Lungi thoughts. Have you watched much of him play? I haven't watched a lot of him play. I haven't chased down the highlights, but from what I, have heard, especially from some of the people around the NRL, he's an absolute gun. So I want to see him play in the NRL at some point very soon. He, what happened last year? He, he was out injured with, I can't remember what, for most of the year. And he just, he just wasn't around enough to really break in. So if he does end up being there, 250K, really good player. Um, I, he's, He's he would pretty much solve our backup winger issues because he would get that wing uh, fullback duel if named there in round one. Yeah, huge. Um, your boy, Greg Marzud, talk away. Oh, look, 
Greggy was one of my favorite owns of all time, to be honest, last year. I've hit so many dodgy pods over the years that the first year that I don't, I did really well. And I still fell into the trap of guys like Ryan Madison over like a horse from mid-season. But Marzu is one of the few that I got really right. But like Gagai, he is now priced at well over 50 as a winger. I just can't see him going up from there. And if anything, he probably comes down a couple of points. So wait for a drop. And if he goes for four or five games without a try for some reason and drops to 575, 80K or even lower, that might be a good time to pick him up, but not at 734K. Yeah, definitely. Kaipi's ball, 520K. They absolutely smashed him with that price point. Is he one of those guys that he's likely going to need 80 minutes to, to have any value if he... If he's fit? Yeah, I, I think so. We've, If you look at the points per minute uh, of your Fords, there's very few edges that will perform as well as a big minute middle. And that's just because they get through more work. So Kai Pierce Paul being uh, priced at about 38 points and we don't know what his pedigree is. Well, we know what his pedigree is from an NRL point of view, but from a stats point of view and in the NRL less so, it's going to be tougher to figure out what he's going to do. So I think he will definitely need that 80 minutes in order to be considered. Uh, otherwise, probably just one you just pass up on. Yeah, it sounds like it could just be fun to watch and, and probably helps out the Knights, even if he's a mm-hmm. sort of an impact try-scoring guy or hopefully off the bench for him. Caelan Ponga, one of the... Uh, Best ones to finish or we'll get close to the end of this video. Thoughts on, on Ponga coming into round one? Uh, I'm really salty they priced him up, hey? And that was the mm. reason. Because if they had put him at his, what, about 51 average, there was a good chance I would have put him in my team. Yeah. Like, there's if there weren't Jaden Campbell and there weren't Ryan Pappenhausen, if, even just one of them not there, and Ponga was priced at 51... I reckon he'd be like 30% owned or more right now. He He's just, he's, I think he's still pretty high anyway, but he would be massive. So yes. we saw what he did in that incredible run last year that basically went from he's no good to, wow, he won the Dally M. Yeah. It was a fantastic run, fantastic season. He performed amazingly. I'm really keen to see what happens for Origin now, mm. but as a fantasy thing, he's one of the few expensive wing fullbacks that I would consider purely because he's got these extra stats like goal kicking to help. Um, but yeah, it is a lot of coin in a position that generally loses money to begin the year with a, a bit of rust and going through the middle a bit more. Definitely. Uh, and that, that, I suppose the thing is, it's, it's just that consistency with him, if we can get that, because I know a lot of Knights fans have been upset with how inconsistent he has been for the Knights and how good he's been in origin. So can he get that from ball one? And does he keep the goal kicking as well? Uh, let's finish off. We've got two guys to talk about here. Will Price at 400K. You've got him here in the green as well. Talk us about. Talk to us about Will. Yeah. To be honest, I have him third in line to partner Hastings uh, behind Cogger and behind Gamble, the incumbent. But if he is there for some reason, I think he could be quite good value. He's got a good step. He'll think he'll work well as a foil to Hastings. And I think, as Mark from the Amateurs said, it would be illegal to have two guys in the spine with as good a step as Ponga and <laughs> Will Price. So I think that I think that he will score better than his price point at 29. It's just, is he named there, which I'm not so confident on. Yeah, it seems like a bit of an unlucky time to come over. Like they've got a lot of good halves at the moment that, you know, Gamble, we weren't sure was going to be there next year, especially after they signed Cogger. And then he went on that incredible run. So it's like, you can't even drop him. And Cogger was amazing in the grand final. So Price is just, he's fourth in line and kind of missing out, you'd imagine. Saifidi boys, Daniel and Jacob, both no value you've got there. And I completely agree. Uh, Anari Twala as well. Even if he was to get that wing spot, he's a no as well, right? Yeah, I think he's one of these guys who scores better at center because of the extra base. Mm. Um and just, yeah, he's about f- nearly 500K for someone who's fringe, hasn't played that much in the last year or two, and hasn't got that fantasy pedigree. Yeah, and then Leo Thompson, he averaged 40 and a half last year, up to 557. 
he kind of already did move into their bigger minute middle role, didn't he? Apart from, you know, Elliot at lock. So is there much room for, for growth on that? Or is it like a, you know, 580, 590 K kind of ceiling? Yeah, that, that's probably what I see for him. There's a world where one of Elliot and Leo Thompson gets a decent amount of extra minutes and pushes their price up a bit. But uh, I think they might both sit on pretty decent minutes and not go crazy. So yeah, for to me, for me, some of the other options are more interesting. Awesome. Let's roll right into that pack predictor now that we're talking about those minutes. So you've still got Thompson there at 45, which... Puts him just overvalued there. Your value guys are sitting there with Jaden Braley potentially if he does get the 70 minutes, which is which is really high, obviously. Um, and then Dylan Lucas, if he, if he was to get that start, it doesn't really look like anyone else has much value apart from Frizzell there. Yeah, I mean, Frizzell, as you said, averaged about 55 last year when he didn't have the head knocks and things like that. But yeah, price has to be right for some of these guys. Um, and there will be these options that do come down from uh, a game where they go off early or a game where they get injured from a little niggle and they come back 50, 60, 100K cheaper. So if you can get those type of guys at the right time, they can really boost your season. But for now, I think you just go for the value guys and just wait for those. You can't bank on it happening. And yeah, if Braley plays 80, according to the, history that we've got in the ppm we've got it'll probably average about low 50s and that's easily 10 points of value but at the moment i've really got to see crossland not touching hooker at all in trials to even want to put Grayley in my team at the moment there's too much too much risk isn't there and then the guy to come out when when kai Pispol returns hetherington yeah it's it's a tough one i think that it would be more likely to be hetherington I sort of thought about it initially. It's just like, oh, Lucas just swaps with Kaipi's ball. Nothing changes. But yeah, like it would make much more sense for Lucas just to go bench and Kaipi's ball to come in there if if they're the better options and Lucas did a really good job last year. So mm, um, goes. if Kaipi's Paul is in the team uh, and looks like he's going to play 80 with no Lucas in there for some reason, sure, good value. If Lucas is in the team with no... Kai Pierce Paul and Kai Pierce Paul looks like he's still injured for a bit or going to play cut for a while. Sure, you can go him. But if they're both in there, yeah, as you said, and then it, yeah, they probably need to play 80 in order to get that value. Yeah, I think if he's Kai Pierce Paul's in that team, it, they they kind of cancel each other out for minutes and yeah, they both need the big minutes and they probably won't get it. Uh, buys for them, round 12, round 16 and round 21. So they play the big ones in 13... And 19, obviously, and they get 14, 17, 20. So only missing one game through that entire period. So very, very good for the non-origin guys that you have, whether it's the value guys, any cheapies that pop up, and any guns like Frizzell and the like, like you mentioned, obviously there, which is awesome. And their start to the draw, Raiders, Cowboys, Storm, Warriors, and then Dragons. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, one thing I did want to touch on, just as you said, they have a really good origin run. They're one of only two teams, along with the Tigers, I think, to play, um, just have the one buy throughout that whole period in season two. They do have one immediately before in round 12 and one immediately after round 21. But if you're only looking for that origin cover sort of guy, uh, if they're the right price, that's a a really good fill-up situation. So... Regarding their early season draw, I think Storm Warriors dents a little bit of potential they might have had to to go uh, quite well. I think the Roosters also will rise a little bit and makes it a little bit harder than it might actually seem. So it doesn't excite me too much to be, to begin the year, this draw. So I think you'd mostly go for the forwards rather than the backs unless you're, unless you're confident that Ponga is Ponga. Ponga will do Ponga things and score a million points. Mm. Yeah, he could probably just do that no matter who he plays. Like the Raiders one's going to be a fun uh, return to the, um, the the finals game they played last year. That's at home for them. I, I predict them to win that one. But yeah, who knows? It could be a real close one as well. Uh, and then the Cowboys away, like if they actually turn up defensively, then that could be a, a fairly tight tussle as well. So yeah, for the most part, I think anywhere in the middle forwards, the edges is going to be awesome. And we haven't really spoke about any outside backs of, of being any sort of interest anyway. So 
yeah, all steam ahead if, with any of those any of those guys that that pop up, whether it's a Lucas, whether it's a Brayley with big minutes. Um, again, edges and middles at this point, and then potentially Ponga that could just do, yeah, great things as he said. So let's leave that one there, guys, with the with the Knights. That was good fun, and we'll get into the Panthers for the next one. <laughs> 